Great, thank you so much. Uh, I want to start with an apology for the fact that I have my talk written out here, which I tend to do because I get very anxious about whether I'm going to make it all the way through a tightly constructed argument in the space of 20 minutes. So bear with me that this feels maybe a little bit more formal um, than some of the um, more open, open papers we've heard already this morning. So, okay, as this audience hardly needs reminding, context is essential to the interpretation of ancient artifacts and artworks. But what is a museum to do when the context of the objects in its possession cannot be publicly acknowledged because to do so might attract unwanted attention to their dodgy origins? How can you present an artwork in your gallery and fulfill your educational mission with an informative label when the object was stolen and any claim of how it got to your door runs the risk of triggering a repatriation claim? It turns out there are many ways to do this, uh, many ways to accomplish these delicate tasks, and American museums at least are well versed in the ways of saying nothing while saying something. How do they do it? I'm going to offer you a case study today uh, that involves going back in time uh, to 1967 when authorities in southern Turkey seized a statue that was in the process of being smuggled out of the country. They forced the smugglers to tell them where they'd gotten it, and eventually the trail led to a village called Bubon, where the locals led municipal authorities to a pit that they referred to as the museum for all the bronze statuary they found there. And this is, this is the pit that the locals call the museum. Um, archaeologists conducted an emergency excavation at the site uh, and found a large three-sided platform inscribed with the names of a number of Roman emperors and empresses from the first to, to the third centuries, plus several more statue bases. But the statues that these bases supported, with the exception of the one I showed you a moment ago, the statues were long gone. Meanwhile, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, a whole bunch of life-size bronze statuary began showing up on the market in Switzerland, London, and New York. It was Yale Inan, a Turkish archaeologist, who first pointed out the remarkable stylistic similarities between the statue that had been seized from Bubon and the pieces that were surfacing on the market and starting to enter public and private collections and no one disagreed with her. In publications in the 1980s and 90s, such as the catalog of the Fire of, Hephaest Fire of Hephaestus exhibition of large classical bronzes from North American collections held at Harvard University Art Museum in 1996, the origin of these newly surfaced life-size bronzes from Bubon was stated as a straightforward matter of fact. And I should say here, um, that we don't have proof that all of these statues came from that site, right? There's no kind of smoking gun linking them. But if you think about the extraordinary rarity of the discovery of large-scale bronzes at, at any time in any place, the fact that literally dozens of these show up on the market all at once right after we learn about the looting of this center for the imperial cult in Turkey, where we know at least one statue that looks like that came from there, makes it, let's say, a very, very high probability that these statues came from this site. Uh, so in other words, then, in 1996, the origin of the statues that were featured in the um, Fire of Hephaestus exhibition, uh, the origins were openly stated as being from Bubon in the catalog. But attitudes toward looted objects have changed drastically since the 1990s. And museums are much more cautious today about admitting that they know where their recent acquisitions came from, because to do so, as I said, runs the risk of a repatriation claim from that source country. So the museums that own the Bubon bronzes are now in a pickle. They know almost certainly where these what these statues are. These are images of emperors and empresses that were erected over the course of 200 years at a shrine to the imperial cult at a small city in southern Turkey. This is pretty exciting information, and museums tend not to want to leave those kinds of facts on the table, but how to reveal all that cool stuff without getting into hot water? I'm going to discuss three examples 
the three largest Bubon statues in public U.S. Uh, collections at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Cleveland Museum of, of Art, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I'll say there's lots of other um, fragments from Bubon. There's a portrait head at the Getty. Um, Santa Barbara has a portrait head. Um, both of those institutions, interestingly, are choosing not to put their Bubon pieces on view. So you can find them in their um, databases online, but they're very much not putting these front and center. These are the only museums that are publicly exhibiting their Bubon materials. And then there's uh, the majority of the statues are still in private collections in the U.S. At the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, a Bubon statue, the earliest to be acquired by a public institution in 1962, looms large over one of the main entrance galleries. And you can, in fact, even see it from the street because there's a large wall of glass uh, just in front of that. The label calls it Roman, a portrait figure of a ruler from 200 to 225 AD. Then we are told that this was a donation by the, by the uh, Menils in memory of this person. And then the label continues, this larger than life-size bronze depicts a Roman emperor with godlike perfect proportions. The first Roman emperor, Augustus, followed the example of antiquity's most famous conqueror, Alexander the Great, and declared himself divine. Subsequent emperors did the same with their statues and monuments, uh, and their statues and monuments portrayed them as perfect gods with little regard for their actual appearances. This rare bronze stands proudly. His lifted arm once held a lance in a gesture of victorious authority. It was probably made for an imperial cult temple in Asia Minor, where the emperor was worshipped. There are several features of this label that stand out to me. The first is that there's no information about where the statue came from, how or when it got to the museum in the tombstone portion of the label, right? This uh, ostensible space of fact um, at the top of the label. The museum is content to leave this, in this space to leave that as totally unknown. But then in the final sentence of the chat part of the label, this longer interpretive portion, uh, where interpretations are presented, we are told that the statue was probably made for an imperial cult in Asia Minor. Uh, as if this were only an educated guess, presumably based on probability, affinities with similar objects whose origins are known, rather than a pretty compelling report of a specific fine spot. So to the unsuspecting visitor, the hypothesis is evidence of the erudition of the curators, who must have used their brilliance and deep learning to figure out what this mysterious object was. In the Houston label, you get the sense that the curators, oh, whoops, sorry, I skipped a page here. Yes, um, a quick aside about this last sentence, and I just want to open this up as a, as a question I have. Note the use of the term Asia Minor instead of Turkey. This substitution is ubiquitous in classical galleries in European and American museums, despite the use of modern country names for pretty much every other part of the Roman Empire. We hear Britain, France, Spain, Greece, Tunisia, Algeria, but never Turkey, always Asia Minor. And I, I would love to discuss that further in the Q&A. Uh, in addition to the strategy of pretending that we, uh, that we can hypothesize what the statue is because of our classical learning, rather than admitting that we know what the statue is because of its fine spot, another rhetorical practice we see in this label is to give a lot of information, not about this actual object, but rather about the background history and especially biographical information about great men. Uh, in this case, Augustus and Alexander the Great, whether directly relevant or not. And here it's pretty much irrelevant. Uh, and here's another little aside. Watch for this pattern the next time you're in a classical museum of substituting human biography of the sitter in place of any information about the actual object and its biography. Here's my favorite example from the British Museum where apropos of this bust, we learn that Caracalla ruled with his brother Gaeta, but, was, but murdered him after a year, that he granted citizenship to all freeborn people in the empire, and that he was murdered while relieving himself during a campaign in the East by an officer whose brother he executed. All titillating facts to be sure, but none of them tells us anything about this actual portrait in front of us. Indeed, the portrait is little more than a pretext to recount what really matters, namely the biography of the important man. 
In the Houston label, you get the sense that the curators were antsy about the fact that the specific identity of the sitter is unknown, so they found a way to name drop Augustus and Alexander the Great <laughs> instead. Similar strategies are in evidence at the Cleveland Museum of Art, where this figure presides over a gallery of Roman sculpture. Here we are told that this is the emperor as philosopher, probably Marcus Aurelius, who reigned from 161 to 180, and that this figure is from 180 to 200, <coughs> that it is bronze, Roman, and was a gift to the museum from a particular fund in 1986. The extremely high quality and monumental scale of this bronze draped figure suggests that it, it, it is an important, excuse me, that su suggests that it is an imperial portrait. The pose with left leg forward, right arm raised to the chest and right hand visible is identical to several Greek portraits of philosophers. The figure is most probably of the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius, who was a student of Stoicism, a set of Greek philosophical beliefs popular among educated Romans of his day. Marcus wrote a collection of philosophical reflections called Meditations. <laughs> the first thing to note about this statue is that Cleveland acquired it in 1986, well after the 1970 UNESCO Accord. This may explain why, unlike the Houston label, uh, there's no reference here whatsoever to any possible context, no mention of a shrine to the imperial cult in Asia Minor or anything like that. The Houston statue, remember, was acquired in 1962, and it seems likely that that museum is less worried about a repatriation claim than Turkey, uh, from Turkey than Cleveland is. Instead of telling us anything about how or where the statue might have been set up in antiquity, the whole label is devoted to, to convincing us that this is, quote, probably Marcus Aurelius. That is how best to account for the high quality, monumental scale, and philosopher iconography. There's two things about this that are problematic. The first is that we know this is Marcus Aurelius because we have a base that says Marcus Aurelius <laughs> at Bubon, where this statue, again, almost certainly came from. <laughs> Secondly, if we didn't know about the connection to Bubon, there would be absolutely no reason to identify this as anything other than a Greek philosopher, since that is what this iconography is conveying 100%. The quality and the scale would never be seen as proof that it is an emperor. Instead, we would take it as proof that it came from Athens. Um, so the only basis to call it an emperor is this connection to Bubon. So here too, as in Houston, what is in reality a fact that derives from knowledge of a particular fine spot is presented as a hypothesis based on clever connoisseurship. Also notice here the way that much of the chat is given over not to any specifics about this actual object, but again, points us away from the statue to semi-relevant biographical information about the great man, right? All this stuff about stoicism and the meditations. The oddest Bubon label of all, and the one that inadvertently reveals the greatest degree of insecurity about the legitimacy of the work's current whereabouts is the one at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It reads, bronze statue of a nude male figure Greek or Roman, Hellenistic or Imperial, <laughs> from 200 BC to 200 AD, an anonymous loan, and we can talk about the significance of that more in a moment. This monumental figure has long been associated with a head in the Nie Carlsberg Liptotech in Copenhagen of the Roman Emperor Septimius Severus, believed to have come from a building devoted to the Imperial cult at the small city of Bubon in Asia Minor, also known as Turkey. Recently, however, it has been shown, recently, however, it has been shown that the two pieces do not belong together, and consequently the date and identification of this figure are open to reconsideration. Few large-scale bronzes of the Hellenistic and Roman period survive. This statue is remarkably well preserved, except for the loss of the head, small detail, and the attributes <laughs> once held in each hand. The body is idealized and the proportions conform closely to Hellenistic trends, making it difficult to determine if the statue is an actual Hellenistic creation or a fine Roman adaptation in the Hellenistic style. It may depict a god, a hero, a Hellenistic ruler, or a Roman emperor. Now, as you can see, the Met is adopting a very different strategy from Houston or Cleveland. And this may have something to do with the fact 
that this object is a loan, um, trying to stave off a repatriation claim for an object that they don't technically own. Um, um, so let me, in the interest of time, let me just skip um, just to a few key details here. Um, I want to start with this point about the, the head in Copenhagen, right? What this is saying is that some have suggested that the body went with one of these heads in Copenhagen. Um, here, oh, here we go, sorry. The head in Copenhagen, uh, which also is associated with Bubon, but they did some testing. They don't match up. Now we know that it doesn't go with the head in Copenhagen. And as a result, we have no idea where this body came from. Um, but of course, as is obvious to anyone who already knows the story, the fact that the head and the body in Copenhagen don't match proves nothing about whether or not this statue came from Bubon. It just means that whatever head of a Roman emperor once topped this statue is still out there somewhere, probably in a private collection. This whole thing about the head in Copenhagen to which the Met devotes half its label is a big red herring. And then the whole second paragraph, as well as the tombstone, keep insisting, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. Now, this should not be mistaken for a healthy dose of postmodern uh, indeterminacy or polyvalency. It is an attempt to prevent a repatriation claim from Turkey by declaring preemptively, you don't have any hard proof that this came from Bubon. One more quick point about this label before I offer you a rewrite of it. One of my least favorite words in it is this word associated. Uh, the head has oops, wait, long been, oh, sorry, going ahead. The head has long been associated, where did this go? Long been associated with this head in Copenhagen. What does that word associated actually mean? It means that it is possible, in fact, very likely, that when it was found, this body still had its head, whether the one in Copenhagen or some other one still attached to it or broken off but lying nearby. And that at some point between the moment of these objects discovery and the time they arrived on the art market, someone chose to separate them from one another in order to sell them individually and make more money. Because selling two objects of exceptional rarity and artistic quality will result in bigger profits than selling one. In the final minutes remaining to me, I want to think about these statues in the context of recent conversations around decolonizing museums. Repatriation would be one way to do that, especially if these statues went back to the regional archaeological museum at Border, near the site where they were found. But in the meantime, the public could learn a lot from a more honest account of the Bubon story, not about great men or the erudition of the curators or the benevolence of the collecting institutions or any of those colonialist narratives. Instead, here is what I would like to see on the Met's label. Oh, sorry, I've gone forward. Uh, here we go. Bronze statue of a nude male figure of uncertain origins and identity, probably from Bubon 160 CE. This statue surfaced on the art market in 1967. It looks very similar to other bronze statues accidentally discovered at a site called Bubon in southern Turkey in 1960s. Local diggers who eventually sold uh, the statues to dealers were so amazed by the abundance of artworks coming out of the ground that they referred to the pit as the museum. In fact, it was likely an ancient shrine dedicated to the Roman emperors. Turkish archaeologists later examined the site and found statue bases with dedications to over a dozen different rulers from the third, first to the third century CE. International art dealers sold the Bubon bronzes to public and private collections in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. The group includes several headless bodies like this one and several bodiless heads, which may have been separated from one another to maximize profits. You can see I'm really ramping it up here, making sure the Met is very likely to take my advice and change their label. Today, these statues would be understood as part of Turkey's cultural heritage and such large scale plundering, dismembering and dispersal would be condemned. Uh, in addition to coming clean about the likelihood of the statue's origins at Bubon, this label acknowledges that we don't know for certain what this is, eschewing the false confidence of so much art historical connoisseurship. It presents the evidence for the hypothesis that the statue belongs to the Bubon group. It acknowledges the agency of the local community that dug it up and the local archaeologists who followed that project uh, on their own terms. 
It acknowledges the fact that the movement of artworks from their fine spot to the museum is propelled more by capitalism than by a desire to take the best care of the past. And finally, it recognizes that the question of whether or not objects like this should be in museums far from their place of origin is still an open one, and that the way we answered that question has shifted over time. Thank you.